We are in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 16. Now the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I've made you a watchman over the house of Israel. When you hear a word from my mouth, give them a warning for me. If I say to the wicked person, you will surely die, but you do not warn him, you don't speak out to warn him about his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person will die for his iniquity, yet I will hold you responsible for his blood. But if you warn a wicked person and he does not turn from his wickedness or his wicked way, he will die for his iniquity, but you will be saved, but you will have saved your life. Now if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and practices iniquity, and I put a stumbling block in front of him, he will die. If you did not warn him, he will die because of the sin, and the righteous acts he did will not be remembered. Yet I will hold you responsible for his blood. But if you warn the righteous person that he should not sin, and he does not sin, he will indeed live because he listened to your warning, and you will have saved your life. Yes, sir. It's Ezekiel chapter 3. Yeah. Yeah. Ezekiel. Did y'all believe I did that on purpose just for Mark's benefit? Here's, here's, will, will you believe that? <laughs> mm. Okay, is everybody in Ezekiel chapter 3 right now? All right. Ancient cities were different from our cities in this day and age. Most cities were small in comparison and did not have all the protection that we have today. And to protect those living in the cities, walls were built around them to fortify them. Watchmen or sentries were then posted along the walls of the city to warn those living within the town of any approaching enemy. As long as they were not taken by surprise, the gates in the walls of the city could be closed and the city could be defended. The watchmen were responsible so that a city would not be taken by surprise. Their job was to stand on the walls or towers of the city, constantly watching their surroundings, scanning the horizon. They had an entire city that counted upon them to warn of imminent danger. They were required to maintain a constant vigil, always looking for any possible threat to the city's safety. It didn't matter if the weather was good or bad, sunny or rainy, lightning or thunder, the watchman could never desert his post. They had to be alert at all times. It was their duty, responsibility to blow a trumpet, alerting the people, have the doors closed, give the soldiers time to man the walls to defend the city. The watchman was held accountable for giving the necessary warning of all impending danger. The very lives of the people in the city were in their hands. It is with this in mind that God declares that Ezekiel was a watchman to Israel and therefore accountable to God for sounding and warning of God's displeasure and judgment of sin. With the issuing of the Great Commission and the empowerment and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that is a mantle that each one of God's children, each Christ follower, is to have placed upon themselves as well. So you and I have been assigned the task and the responsibility of being watchmen for our generation. Everyone who's decided to know and to serve Christ has been selected and called to be a watchman to this world. True. Preachers, we have somewhat of a different assignment it is true that we must give an account of how well we have served the Lord and taught and equipped you. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 it says that we will have to give an account for how well we have watched over your souls. The pastor's calling is a unique calling. And yet at the same time the Bible says that each of us are called to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. His representatives spots of light in a dark and dying world. And we cannot simply sit back resting upon the knowledge of our established relationship with God, guaranteeing our home in heaven to be totally oblivious to and unconcerned about those without Christ 
or those who have cooled off in their companionship and their obedience and their following of Jesus. A man once prayed like this, Lord, bless me and my wife, my son John and his wife, us four and no more. A childless couple prayed, Lord, bless us too and that will do. An old bachelor prayed, Lord, bless only me. That's as far as I can see. You and I cannot take such a careless attitude. As a caring church, we must share Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. Not with a spirit of arrogance. Not with a critical or judgmental spirit. But as one hungry person who has found food, sharing with another person where they can find food. As one person rescued from darkness who has found the light, sharing with others where they can find light as well. We are responsible and obligated to faithfully sound the alarm. And the assignment, the importance of the assignment that has been given to us is driven home to us again and again through the pages of God's Holy Scripture. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23 we are told for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death and there is only one means, only one way of salvation. And it's your responsibility and mine to sound the alarm. Romans 3.23 we're told for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 5.12 we're told wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. There's coming a day when Jesus will come again. And there is coming a day when all who die apart from a saving knowledge and a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ will have to give an account. Do you realize that there are between 95 and 100 million people in this country who never darken the door of a church? Without Christ, when they die, they will all enter into a Christless eternity. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 reminds us the soul that sins it shall die. Regardless of how we are received our responsibility is to sound the alarm. In Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 4 we read then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning if the sword come and take him away his blood shall be upon his own head. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 and it is appointed unto men once to die. And then the judgment. The Bible tells us every individual is on a direct collision course with God's judgment. God has provided a haven in Christ designed to keep people from suffering eternal death and separation from God. But everyone must decide whether or not to accept that offer and to accept that gift. Every individual is accountable to God for what they do with the gospel. It doesn't matter how well our message is received, it is still our obligation to declare the good news of the gospel. It is our responsibility to bring the message that God wants us to bring regardless of how it is appreciated or acted upon. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, Paul tells Timothy, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, extort with long suffering and doctrine. Earnestly proclaim the word of God whether or not the situation or time is favorable. It is our responsibility to take a stand without compromise. We live in a day and time when it is popular to compromise God's word and God's standards in an attempt to get a hearing in an effort to keep from offending folks and some claim Jesus would not be rude or he would not offend folks. Are you kidding me? What would Jesus do? Well, let me remind you, Jesus was known to turn over tables and chase livestock with whips. Jesus was known to confront the religious folks and say, you're nothing better than whitewashed tombs. 
You've cleaned up and decorated the outside. You've cleaned up your language a little bit. You've learned a few Christian phrases, a few church phrases. You may dress a little different and act a little different, but on the inside you're still dead. Are you kidding me? Jesus not offending anyone? You see, Jesus loved folks enough to tell them the truth. The week before last, I had a conversation with someone online who was saying that folks who support our president are the bottom of the barrel. Now, I'm not here to discuss politics. And I don't even know this person that I was talking to when I set up my Facebook account. I didn't do it so much to keep up with friends and such. I set it up as a ministry tool. And as a result, anybody who um, sends me a friend request, unless it's one of those women in negligees or something, I accept the request. Because I want the opportunity to interact with folks and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this particular post, this woman was sharing that anyone who supports our president is part of the bottom of the barrel. Now the reason she was saying this at that particular time was because he was going to be addressing a Christian family organization. And she said that they were haters because they talked about the, the lesbians and the homosexuals and the bisexuals and I'm like, are you kidding me? Because an organization stands for traditional marriage? Because a group of people say that in the beginning God created man and woman? Put them together in one family, one home? That was God's plan and design from the very beginning? And studies have shown again and again that God's plan is the plan that works the best? And because someone says that God's ideals are best, they are haters in the bottom of the barrel? It is not our place to compromise, to change, or to dilute the Word of God in order to make people comfortable in their lost conditions. The man, the woman who stands on the wall, stands for truth. Save your places and turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I think I got that one right. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, uh, greedy people, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Some of you were like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God and all God's people said. Amen. You see, God's kingdom is not made up of perfect people. It is made up of people like you and I. People who have a history. Perhaps who have walked in the world. People who have slandered and gossiped and cheated. Have done all sorts or manner of sins. But people who have come to the realization that they are not living according to God's plan, God's will, or God's way. People who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and who have asked Him to forgive them of their sins and lived a changed lifestyle. Does that mean that we are without mistake? Does that mean that we live sinless lives from that day forward? Anybody who knows me knows that ain't the case. But the difference is, when you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to live a life that's pleasing to Him. And you confess your sins and you do not make excuses saying that God made me this way. Wednesday and Thursday nights, I had a discussion with another man online who described himself as a Christian homosexual. And I asked him, how do you put those two words in the same sentence? And then he wanted to 
go into some dynamics on what the original words meant and all of that. And I said, I'm familiar with them. Here, let me show you what the original word is in the Greek and what it means. And I said, the majority of our translations translate it this way. And then he sent me a link to a Bible website that I had just checked before I commented to him. You see, my friends, Jesus did not come to make people comfortable in their sin. Jesus came to pay the price for our sin. And to tell us that there was another way. And that through a relationship with him, we can be saved. Verse 11, Paul said, such were some of you. You see, my friends, the Lord Jesus Christ can change our lives. And change our hearts. When nothing else in the world can do so. Like the gathering demoniac. Who Jesus cleansed and sent home to his family once again. We take a stand on the wall for the word of God. And tell them that even though times have changed, God has not. His word and his standard has not. We take a stand reminding folks of how God works. Reminding folks of what's important. Yesterday I had the opportunity to meet a guy by the name of Ray. I met him in passing quickly uh, one time earlier in the week. Ray is the, the yard manager for Dave Fence here in Deberry up on um, uh, Dirksen. And uh, I'd stopped by there earlier in the week and made arrangements to go by yesterday morning to pick up some fence panels to build some shacks that we're going to be building for Christmas in the country. He said, anytime between 6.30 and noon, I should be there. I said, okay. So I left all of y'all working and I took a ride over there yesterday and uh, went to pick up the fence panels. Now Ray told me, he said, every other time I've been here for the last year, we always have trailer loads of old fence panels and I could just load it up with a forklift put it in your trailer and you'd be good to go in no time but he said when I got here this morning that was not the case there was not a trailer with old fence panels anywhere on the yard the only old fence panels there were were in a, were in a big old dumpster so instead of just getting it and going Ray and I spent half hour 45 minutes digging fence panels out of a dumpster and I guess Part of the reason we did that was because God wanted to give Ray and I the opportunity to visit so he could share his testimony. While we were talking and visiting, he started, we talked about hurricanes. The subject came up. He said, I lived in New Orleans when Katrina hit. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I had a good job. I worked in the oil fields. I was making $100,000 a year. He said, I had a nice house. I was within $5,000 of paying it off. He said, the hurricane hit. And suddenly my job was gone. A 30-foot pecan tree was blown into my house. The insurance company would not cover it. And he said, I ended up having to pay $5,000 to have my own house bulldozed and ended up selling an empty lot. I and my family loaded up and we decided to move to Florida. He said we stopped at campgrounds along the way. And each time we'd stop at a campground, I'd see if there was some work I could do, something to help pay the way on the trip. He finally ended up at Blue Springs. He was there when his mom finally called. He said, you know, you, you better check. He said, uh, school's about to start and in Florida it starts earlier than a lot of places. He said he got the check and then sure enough school was about to start and um, he found a mobile home a guy would rent him in Orange City. He gave him the last $300 he had and rented a mobile home in Orange City. He and his family moved in. He said, I thought I had lost everything in the world. But he said, you know the thing is when I was in New Orleans, I worked all the time. I never saw my kids. I could give money, we could buy the toys, we could buy all of that stuff, but I was never home. 
never had meals together. My wife and I fought. I drank all the time. He said, when I lost everything and we moved here, the only job I could find was one paying me $8 an hour. But he said the difference was I was home every night for supper. And my wife and I, we rebuilt our relationship. My children and I, we rebuilt our relationship. And he said, I'm closer to the Lord than I've ever been before in my life. Because God took everything I thought was important. One of our calls, one of our responsibilities is to take a stand and remind people of what is important. Because this life is just preparation for what's coming next. This is the school, the boot camp, preparing us for what's coming next. And sometimes I'm afraid that some of us get too wrapped up in the trappings and the trimmings in this life. And we forget what is really important. The call that God has placed on all of our lives. The preparation for what's coming next. And the importance of sharing with others the importance of a relationship with Jesus Christ. We take a stand reminding folks of how God works. And we are accountable for our faithfulness to our responsibility for how we share the word. And please, we ask you chapter 3, verse 18 again. We read, If I say to the wicked person, you will surely die, but you do not warn him, you don't speak out to warn him about his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person will die for his, for his iniquity, yet I will hold you responsible for his blood. But if what, did I say the wrong place again? Huh? Okay, ignore what I say. You know what I mean. Please ask you chapter 3. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, my word. Bonnie, what did you put in the coffee? But if we warn a wicked person and he does not turn from his wickedness or his wicked way, he will die for his iniquity but you will have saved your life. We are accountable for whether or not we share the gospel and for whether or not we are the witness that God has called us to be. You remember Paul. Paul, the one who had persecuted the church. Paul, the one who had had Christians arrested and thrown into prison had broken up families. Paul, because of this faithfulness, where he said, I, I told you in the temple and from door to door. He taught, he witnessed. In his last days, Paul said, my hands are clean from the blood of all men. Because he knew the call that God had placed on his life and everywhere he went, he was a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you, my friend, who are you taking to heaven with you? What are you doing to make an impact? To reach folks? To share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ? What are you doing to take a stand to remind people that God has standards and they are not the world's? The first thing that we must do is make sure that we have established that relationship ourselves. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, the Bible says, There is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, everyone is in need of a Savior. And that is why God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. John 3, 16, we're told, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you enough to send His Son. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My 
My friends, our relationship with Jesus Christ, entrance into the kingdom, begins by admitting that you have a need. That you cannot solve or take care of yourself. Admitting that you have sinned and asking God to forgive you of your sin. Second, we invite Jesus Christ to come into our heart to be our Lord and Savior. To live within us is calling on our lives. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and sup with him and he with me. We make a commitment, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the boss of my life. I want you to come in and I want you to guide me and I want you to direct me and I want you to introduce me to people, allow me to meet people that you want me to share with. We make a commitment to faithfully and continuously serve and walk with God. And then we tell others about the decision that we have made. Jesus said, if you confess with your mouth, uh, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. And that is one of the reasons that we are baptized. We are, we are making a, a public profession that I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. I have been adopted into his family. I'm placing all of my hope in Jesus Christ. Because I cannot save myself. If you have not taken care of that, I invite you to do that today. And second, if you have become a follower of Jesus Christ, let me ask you, would you today say, Lord, I want to be your man. I want to be your woman. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want to make my life count. The day is coming when we will be face to face with our creator and have to give an account for what we have done or neglected to do as watchmen. In 1928 a very interesting case came before the courts in Massachusetts. It concerned a man who had been walking on a boat dock when suddenly he tripped over a rope and fell into the cold deep water of an ocean bay. He came up sputtering and yelling for help then sank again obviously in trouble. His friends were too far away to get to him, but only a few yards away on another dock, a young man was sprawled on a deck chair sunbathing. The desperate man shouted, help, I can't swim. The young man, an excellent swimmer, only turned his head to watch as the man floundered in the water, sank, came up sputtering in total panic and then disappeared forever. The family of the drowned man was so upset by that display of callous indifference that they sued the sunbather and they lost. The court reluctantly ruled that the man on the dock had no legal responsibility whatever to save the other man's life. And we say how awful this young man was, but is it any less callous to allow those who cross our paths to speed their way to hell without any warning from us? James tells us in James chapter 4 verse 17, Therefore to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. In Romans chapter 14 verse 11 and 12 we read, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We must faithfully sound the alarm clearly. Billy Graham's book, Approaching Hoofbeats, he tells the story of Harry Truman. Mount St. Helens belched gray steam plumes hundreds of feet into the blue region sky. Geologists watched their seismographs in growing wonder as the earth danced beneath their feet. Rangers and state police, sirens blaring, herded tourists and residents from an ever-widening zone of danger. Every piece of scientific evidence being collected in the laboratories and on the field predicted the volcano would soon explode with a fury that would leave the forest flattened. Warning blared to loudspeakers on the patrol cars and helicopters hovering overhead. Warning blinked by battery powered signs at every major crossroad. Warning pleaded radio and television announcers, shortwave and citizen band operators. Warning echoed up and down the mountain and lakeside villages, tourist camps and hiking trails emptied as people heard the warnings and fled for their lives. But Harry Truman refused to budge. 
Harry was the caretaker of a recreation lodge on Spirit Lake, five miles north of Saint Mount St. Helens Peak. The rangers warned Harry of the coming blast. Even Harry's sister called to talk sense into the old man's head. But Harry ignored the warnings. I watched some of the videos of Harry's interviews. He said, I'm part of Spirit Lake and Spirit Lake is part of me. I know this mountain like no one else. It'll never do anything to me. I'm five miles from its peak. There's forest between here and there. Nothing will happen to me. On May 18th, 1980, as the boiling gas beneath the mountain surface bulged and buckled the landscape to its final limits, Harry Truman cooked his eggs and bacon, fed his 16 cats to scraps, and began to plant petunias around the border of his freshly mowed lawn. At 8.31, the mountain exploded. Did Harry regret his decision in that millisecond he had before the concussion waves traveling faster than the speed of sound flattened him and everything else for 150 square miles? Did he have time to mourn his stubbornness as millions of tons of rock disintegrated and disappeared into a cloud reaching 10 miles into the sky? Did he struggle against a wall of mud and ash 50 feet high that buried his cabin? his cats and his freshly mowed lawn? Or had he simply disappeared? My friends, many of us would continue carrying on day after day as though it will never happen to us. As though this will continue forever. But my friends, there is coming a day when Jesus will come again. Are you ready?